Welcome back to Free Founders, where we share actionable lessons from the world's best solopreneurs and small business owners. This is for aspiring entrepreneurs who want proven strategies to go from zero to first sell and upwards to scale and enjoy the freedom that comes along with it. My guest today is Tamir Bashkin. Tamir has uh, a decade of entrepreneurial experience and he's still in the game, which is great to see. He runs uh, Adelante, a Zendesk implementation ag agency, bringing in 300K per year, and also runs Thank You GBT, bringing in 30K annual recurring revenue. There's also cybersecurity products in the works that he's working on. I think we'll hear about that a little bit later. In this episode, expect to learn why Tamir sees SaaS as a huge opportunity for aspiring entrepreneurs. Second, why finding freedom is more complicated than it looks as a founder. And thirdly, how to start your own micro SaaS. Welcome, Tamir. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great to have you. And as we'll find out later, for selfish reasons, this comes at a really good time for me. I want to pick your brain. Uh, but to kick us off, a month ago, you wrote, quote, I knew the right move was to go into SaaS, not to make shit tons of money, appear on the Forbes 40 under 40, or raise VC money and feel important. Tell me about that quote. So really what I, I, I was at, a, let's say, I was at an existential crisis a few, a few months ago. I was making enough money to meet my goals and I was thinking, should I just do two or three times more than what I'm doing or should I do something else? And I realized what I was missing. I was missing people uh, with me. I was quite lonely in that uh, entrepreneurial uh, journey and I was uh, working mainly with myself. I was working mainly on uh, stuff that involved just me. And I wanted to build a team. I wanted to uh, start giving back to other people. I wanted to coach people. I wanted to have people working with me. And so I realized it's very difficult to achieve that with an agency. Uh, an agency's vision, mission, uh, where it's going is very flexible, is very fluid. And you always end up working on client work and a lot of the times you neglect working on your own business whereas i saw SaaS as a way to unify people and create a mission or a vision that is bigger than a, than an agency work on the one hand but also very focused you're only working on your product it's very it's laser focused once you find a product you're laser focused and this is why I wanted to step into the SaaS world. It's interesting because it, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, as you say, it, most people starting a business will, I found this was the case for me, you know, you work so hard to get to the point where you can maximize revenue or some way, or ultimately I think as particularly solopreneurs, maximize money in your pocket. So get financial freedom and that can then create a nice foundation for freedom of time and i think it's interesting that you you know you, once you get there you go oh actually maybe that's not exactly what i want out of life right obviously it, it's great you know it's, it's a hell of a lot better than than working a job that you dislike or having a, a boss but um it comes with its own own trade-offs um I think it's, it's really important to remember that goals are like a moving target. You, the goalpost keep, keeps moving. So once you get somewhere, you climb the mountain and then you don't see like the, the climb. You don't see the, the path you climb. You see the mountain like up next. So really, I think what's important is enjoying the, the road you're on and enjoying the process. And, and yeah, once I got to my goals, I figured out I have new goals. I have new uh, desires or wishes that I didn't have uh, in the past, and so I recalibrated uh, for for those uh, objectives or for those uh, things that I wanted to achieve. How, how did you How do you think about goal setting as an entrepreneur? Because obviously, there's, there's no one saying to me you need to set goals, and nobody's keeping an eye on whether you change the goals, uh, you know, how you are progressing. Uh, I found it's very easy 
so Pro MBA was written by sort of like big success as a solopreneur. And before that, I would have said, if I get a hundred thousand pounds, so what, 120,000 euros in my pocket every year, pff, amazing, great. I have a cheap lifestyle, live off that, retire early, do it for a couple of years, invest, right, move to Bali or somewhere. Um, and then I've, obviously, as you, you, you start hitting that goal, you, you, you sort of just move the goalpost. How did you set concrete goals for yourself? And what were those? So my initial goals were very similar to yours. Like, uh, I want to make $10,000 a month. I want to be able to work from anywhere. And I want to be able to work four hours a, a day. You know, I was inspired by the Tim Ferriss for our work week and everything. And once I hit those goals, I realized, A, uh, it's very difficult to hire people when you're just making, let's say, $10,000 um, a month. So you end up working with people that aren't as qualified as you are, which leads to B, that is you work four hours a day, but you work every day. You do not have time off. It's like you're constantly plugged into into work you're constantly available there is always stuff coming up so and and really like working remotely and being in bali or whatever is pretty it was like radical in 2019 2018 but now with covid it's like it's it's kind of like the the baseline (laughs) so that's that goal kind of like solved itself and i was okay i got I got up until here. I am pretty alone in this in this thing. I I also kind of got tired of doing the same. Uh, obviously, productized, well scoped, processed uh, implementation uh, work. So basically, I got the holy grail. I had like a product. Uh, I it, it was really standardized. I could do it. Uh, I could pretty much uh, run it on the same, like on autopilot, but that kind of got boring uh, for me. Plus, I was missing the human interaction. I was missing, you know, seeing people, thinking with people. At a certain point, I had this, um, I, like, uh, this radical thought of maybe getting a job. Um so so I realized I probably need to find a way to build a, a team around the work I'm doing instead of continuing to to work solo. Yeah, it's I find many parallels for myself there. Uh, one question I always ask myself is if I had hired more Maybe that would have created the team thing. Maybe that would have firstly helped the business grow. Secondly, you know, helped me enjoy that business more. Not that I didn't, but I think, I mean, do you think that that is the nature of a client work, right? Whether it's a consulting business or, you know, in your case, an agent's, well, agency, let's say, that ultimately you are, you're on demand in some way, right? To step up from freelance because you're not billing per hour but you are still ultimately like you are required to deliver a certain amount of value. And you put, I find you put pressure on yourself as well to, you know, over deliver or make sure you're really delivering for them. Do you think that's just the nature of those kind of businesses? I think for agencies, it's, um, first, it's very difficult to, to build a solid a solid and lean agency because either you charge per hour and then immediately your North Star becomes let's get the cheapest people and pay them the le- pay them the least I can and have them work as long as they can so I can bill hourly and and make and make money off basically the whole premise of an agency that's billing hourly is let's charge the the hourly rate that the founder charges and then bring someone uh, yeah. of lower skill to, to do the work. So that's pretty much the, um, the promise of hourly agencies. And the, I remember that the moment I got into the hourly agency model, I tried to break away from it. It took me like three years, but I kind of like I was actively looking for ways to break away from the hourly agency model all the time. And I think 
other agencies or other you know models and productized services or stuff like that could potentially uh, work um, but I'm just seeing that for some reason I, I don't know why but people that work with you are more fascinated by the concept of building software products building something that can be uh, you know infinitely scalable it's it's extremely funny but I had really hard time like getting people excited about building a, a productized service for implementing Zendesk but I've had people like stand in line to work with me on on the Zendesk automation plugin just because it's like software and SaaS and and not yeah. uh, and and not an agency that just does work yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I've always found myself tempted to go back into, you know, I wouldn't do a VC back startup myself, but I would probably quite happily go in as an early stage product person because it's just interesting work. Right? As long as I'm not yeah. relying on, you know, the business paying out and bec exiting, becoming a big success and it, you know, it pays my bills, then, then, you know, intellectually it is very interesting work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that sort of trickles in, obviously, you know, the kind of people you're working with, right? You want to be around the most ambitious and interesting and diverse group and i think as you say you're going to get that more in software because it just attracts a certain not always i think you know corporate software people it's just an easy gig right no, no accountability to deliver yeah. anything but but if, if it's a startup then then i've i've always found that i really connect with the people working on it um you're still running atlantic um it's bringing in 300k a year just to be clear, like what, why are you still running that? How does that tie into your sort of bigger picture vision strategy personally? So Adelante is really the source of funding for everything I do. So I still have uh, projects that come in. I still have um, assets online that, you know, drive traffic in and get the odd uh, Zendesk project every one or two months that is very easy to for me to, to do and, and pays well. I've been struggling with that for a while and thinking maybe I should uh, shut it down and, you know, burn the bridges and uh, have to succeed with the new stuff I'm doing. But now I'm more looking at this as revenue channels. So if you're looking at Adelante, let's say, on average it may and let's kind of like if i if i'm leaving it on the side and i get let's say one implementation or, or every like three or four months then that creates a certain revenue thank you gpt is creating a certain revenue and over time i'm looking to build this uh, inventory of assets that would pull together to create substantial revenue versus uh, having like a one uh, one thing that I rely on and does everything uh, for me. I also know myself. I'm a, I'm a bit jumpy, uh, and I enjoy I enjoy working on different stuff, and I lose interest very quickly. So, being able to have different uh, products or different areas that I can jump in and out. And they more or less do fine without my constant attention, but I can jump in and out as as needed. Keeps me more engaged and more interested than just being focused on a certain thing for the for the next five years or so. If you're enjoying this episode and want to get each shiny new episode straight to whatever platform you use to listen to your podcast, please subscribe using the subscribe button below. Yeah, you raised a really important point that I I'm generally against people trying to do too much. Like I, I personally have always seen results when I just go really focused on one thing. Uh, however, that is also, and this is where advice I think always needs to be based on context. That is because if I'm looking at, you know, my recent past running product, I'd be like, that is a business that requires daily content creation, sales calls, conversations on LinkedIn. Right? There's a lot of, of work to keep the funnel topped up. 
Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've never been in the lucky position where I've just got millions of people queuing up, selling out product, but not millions of people queuing up at the, at the door. So in that case, it's, you know, as soon as I, I step back from that, then it's, it's, you're going to see a drop in revenue. Whereas I think we'll talk about this next, you know, SaaS, that was a digital product. If it, if it's set up, it has a certain funnel of you, maybe you could hire someone into that and it's paying for it, or uh, it has enough referral word of mouth, whatever it is to, keep bringing in customers then then there's a good argument to say okay well yeah you can you can split your time right split your focus across a few different um different products and it sounds like that you know you're very much adult very much established consistent revenue you don't have to do much work to bring people in to deliver the value that then i think this is a really good example where where you're not so much switching focus because it's it's just almost running itself in the background Exactly. Um, it's in, it's in kind way. of on the back burner. I, and one thing I'm seeing is that uh, those different projects, they give me an opportunity to learn uh, different things. So, for example, to run Google Ads for Adelante is, doesn't really make sense. There, there aren't a lot of uh, searches for that. I've tried that a few times in the past. It doesn't really work out. But running Google Ads on Zendesk apps, for example, to, to bring people to the thank you, that makes sense. There, there is like volume there. So suddenly I'm taking a skill that I need to have and I haven't been able to work on while I was in Adelante and because I was always focused on sales and products and partnerships and so on and so on. So I'm taking a skill I didn't have a chance to work on and I'm working on it or I'm training myself on that skill uh, to a different product and and you could potentially you know also make the case of if i'm spinning up three or five different zendesk uh, plugins is this different are, are those different products or is this like really one thing that is uh, shared that that has different i guess sub uh, features or sub products so um the cybersecurity and the thank you gpt are pretty uh, pretty different obviously but i'm looking at everything that happens in the uh, zendesk world as as something that is uh, pretty much under the same umbrella yeah and that's um i think also a, a good thing to think about for other entrepreneurs sort of building upon existing work in a way so i actually got this advice from an entrepreneurial friend recently and thinking well beginning of this year thinking about sort of launching another business he said you know don't throw everything out do, do you know whether it's leveraging the same audience you built before or relationships in some way or some experience you have it's going to be easier to sort of build upon something than start completely from zero um and i think in your case that that's particularly as it's revenue generated or very profitable sort of staying building that like ecosystem or bundle of products um i think it's a really interesting uh, approach Let's talk about SaaS, um, you know, because you've been an entrepreneur since 2015. Recently, again, coming back to that quote, I knew the right move was to go into SaaS. So wh why do you think SaaS is different as a, as a business, right? Obviously, it's digital, it's more exciting, it's tech, everyone loves tech. Why, why, why do you think for you individually, let's say as a solopreneur, this makes a lot of sense? So really, um... The reason I went into SaaS is to be able to build a team. And I found after looking at, at different angles, the easiest angle to build a solid uh, team is by going into SaaS. I'm almost looking at it as if I want to build like a commando unit that does one thing and does it very well. I don't want like a 500 people company, at least not now. I'm more looking to have like a 5, 10, 15 people working on a very strong uh, product, people that I enjoy working with, people that uh, allow me to create, um, to create, in a sense, building a company is like creating your own bubble in the world. And I want to create like a reality or a bubble that I enjoy uh, participating in, that I enjoy being part of. And so I'm looking at at, uh, at 
building that community or building that team as my next goal is and SaaS is just the uh, a mean to an end so if if the easier if the if the best team to build a team and unite very successful people around the goal would be to start a zoo i would have started a zoo <laughs> um but apparently it's it's uh, SaaS. so so this is where i'm going uh what this is what i'm going into now and I, I love I love just your the clarity you have about what you think is important um because I think this is another thing we're writing about uh you ba- you have financial freedom right so you know, it's like three hundred k a year i mean I, I don't know your daily spending, but that is a, you know you could easily go off and uh, and uh, live in Bali and and not work now, and yet you are you know being quite deliberate about the kind of business you want to use um next bring me to the another question around would you do you think if you for example had this realization or you've had this realization recently that SaaS is the way forward would you have done anything differently in your entrepreneurial career up until now or, or do you think it's just you have to go through these experiences to realize oh, okay i'm going to adjust based on this new experience my new worldview etc so I would have done a few a few things differently uh, in the process. So I, I think the process um, where I where I spent too much. I, I think there were points in the process where I spent too much time uh, going going in circles, and I could have avoided that. First thing is staying in, in the Israeli market for too long, rather than just going into the US and from I had a lot of psychological barriers my accent isn't good enough my English isn't good enough uh, I don't live there and so on and so on and so on um, but once I made a decision that I'm I'm going for it uh, I it took me like I guess four months to go from I only work with Israeli customers to my first American customer, and from there it's been like a uh, like a domino uh, of you know another American customer, another American customer working on this. That, that has for me, I think I think that that was like a ten x move for me, just moving away from the local market into the American market. Probably should have done that sooner. Uh, the other thing I would I would say in regards to SaaS is, and that's probably for all the uh, agencies, freelancers, uh, professional services guys in you know, girls in in the audience, is really like try and package what you are doing because I've done a lot of stuff. The the, the uh, my problem was I never packaged it as a product someone can just buy off the internet set up and and get started with and it was always kind of like a back-end solution and really the first thing i properly packaged was the thank you gpt and that blew up like blew up relatively but gained traction uh fairly quickly so so i think i think this is this is like one tip i would say everything you do as even if you're doing agency work even if you're doing uh, something that is uh, customized. Always look at how you can package this for. There, there is definitely someone else that needs this. Well, when you say package, do you, I mean I, t- I talk about productizing yourself, right? So if you're a freelancer, what is that? Is that selling? Like, here are three options of how you work with me. You know, five thousand a month versus ten thousand a month, depending on what you want or one off. That kind of thing. I think it's a, board, a, a bit more advanced than than that because mm-hmm. retainer really is just you know counting the number of hours and and putting them in in a package. Um, what I'm talking mm-hmm. about is either creating like a productized service. So, for example, we were doing Zendesk setups, and over like one time, I got this random call from a super small customer in Israel and they wanted to pay me like $500 to implement Zendesk for them and they were tiny and and so I I took that project I gave it to my newest hire for like training purposes and then I realized he was 
kind of copy pasting stuff uh, mm. between instances. And I said, whoa, like we could automate that and we could sell this uh, standardized Zendesk package uh, to everybody. And, and once, once I packaged that, it took me a couple of months to, to package it properly and understand what needs to go in and what needs to go out. But basically, once this was packaged, I was able to sell it for first the $500 or $1,000 into Israelis. Then eventually, right now, I'm selling more or less the same package service for $12,000 to American customers. So basically, by packaging this and creating a product around this, and not keeping this a manual freelancer process, I was able to raise the prices to a point where if you calculated the hourly rate on a Zendesk implementation, I'm probably making around $1,000 an hour for every Zendesk implementation that comes in right now. Obviously, it's, it's not the right way to calculate that, but if you measure, if you wanted to measure the, um, the, in the hourly, um, in, in the hourly, but like pricing, and obviously nobody would pay you a thousand dollars an hour if you told them you're charging a thousand dollars an hour. They would be like, you can't be charging that much per hour. <laughs> but once you package your what you're doing into a product, and the product costs a certain price, okay, that's that's the price for a process. That's the price for uh, what I'm going to um. To, for what I'm going to get out of this, and I always kind of like compare it to a supermarket. You never, first, you never. It also helps you. I, I compare it to a supermarket in two different ways. One, you never walk into a supermarket and go to the cereals and open cereal A and cereal B and start mixing them. Right? It never happens. You never. You never. You you have like Oreos or you have like I don't know something else Cheerios, but that's it. You don't. Mm -hmm. You don't open the packages and start mixing them like customers, like clients do when you're doing freelancing work. They're opening your package and they're starting to mix what you're doing. No, I need something like this. I need I need that bit. Mm -hmm. I need more of this. And the second thing, you don't go into the supermarket and think hey, the factory is spending that much on rent and that much on electricity. So how comes the, the cereals cost like so much? No, you, you see the product. It's either expensive for you, it's either in your budget, it's either or it's cheap for you, but you're not starting to calculate, you're not having resistance based on just you know how much the cereals uh, cost. Whereas if you work hourly, people would then you say, oh, okay, I'm charging a thousand an hour, people would normally for ninety nine percent of the freelancers uh, go and say, Well, how comes he's charging uh, so much? So those were things I that productizing the freelancing work helped me uh, avoid. And then on the SaaS front, so basically this thank you plugin started like everything else started for me. It was a backend automation built on make.com uh, for a customer. And then after, uh, like I've, I've had a few um, times that I built a backend automation and didn't productize it properly. And and then with a the thank you, I said, it's so simple to productize. Let's package it. Let's put it on the Zendesk Marketplace. Let's make it easy for people to just install it and get started. And let's see what happens. I, I want to talk about thank you, GBT. Um, so you're running Adelante and then come up with a problem you're facing. Tell me about that sort of origin story around thank you, GBT. And then afterwards, I, I definitely want to talk about monetization there. Like, so how did you come up with the idea? Because this is a huge blocker for aspiring entrepreneurs. So the way it started is I had a customer reach out to me that I was implementing Zendesk for. So where I was in an ongoing relationship with him. And he would reach out and say, hey, you know, we have this annoying problem of people reaching out saying, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the help. And it reopens the ticket. So imagine... If that's in your Gmail, then you an someone sends you a message, you answer, you put it in the archive, then he responds, he says, thank you. That brings the message to the top of your inbox again. So obviously, if that happens um, 
once a day, it's not a big deal. But in service organizations, this can, this can happen like 10,000 or 20,000 times a, a month. So then it becomes, it starts being some quite an annoyance uh, for them. Um, so he told me about this problem. And then the second thing I did after hearing about the problem from him, the next thing I did was a good, just going to the Zendesk forums, the Zendesk community, go to the feature request forum and search like, thank you. And I found it like two threads with like 80 comments each of people complaining about this since 2014. That was in 2021. And I said, okay, like if there are like 150 people complaining about this for like seven years and Zendesk haven't solved it yet, there is probably something that's worth, you know, investing a thousand dollars into having someone build it for me and package the whole thing for the Zendesk marketplace. That's what I did. Started having uh, some initial traction um, immediately when it launched on the on the marketplace. So started just seeing people installing it and playing with it and testing it out. But it wasn't good enough. It was based on regex. So basically, it would detect messages correctly if they said, thank you, thank you very much, and so on and so on. But if, if it said, thank you, Henry, you're amazing. I just renewed because of your uh, excellent service. Then it would know to capture that, that phrase. Maybe they wouldn't even say thank you. Awesome. That's great. That's a valid thank you response. Mm. But... They w it wouldn't capture that. So it was nice, but it wasn't really useful to the point you could monetize that. And then ChatGPT came in, and I'll stop here and let you yeah, ask Yeah, okay, I love this quote I was reading. Uh, I think it's from one of your interviews. Quote, for two years, this tool sat in the marketplace of a CRM platform that was Zendesk. Didn't generate any revenue for the simple reason that I didn't ask for any. Tell me about that and when things change when you actually made revenue yeah so chat gpt came in i immediately re i actually played a bit with a gpt3 uh, api like a year before and i realized i i may have like i may be able to automate that better but back then i got quotes for like you know machine learning scientists that wanted to charge me like fifty thousand dollars to build a, a model an ai model that would detect thank yous correctly and i was like obviously i'm not gonna do that and then gpt uh, 3.5 the api came out and i plugged that in i saw that it in immediately you know spiked the, the number of tickets we were solving immediately spiked and people were like wow that's working much better what have you done because they didn't connect the chat gpt and everything and and the plugin uh, performance uh, increased and then basically I sent everyone that was using the plugin an email. Hey, I'm charging $50 a month. You can pay or you can not pay. If you don't pay, I'm going to shut it down. And eventually 20 people paid. That got me to like $1,000 uh, MRR. And then we started making some more pro uh, upgrades to the product. We, we built the UI. And we start investing more in email marketing and in the activation process and really working on a bit more the uh, customer experience and also on the product marketing. That got us to 2,500 uh, MRR, which is where we are now. And yeah, it's an, it's an interesting product because it's, it's from on one hand, it lands in the very nice to have, um, you know, um, it's a it's a very nice to have product. It's not critical to anybody's operation in in any way. Uh, on the other hand, it does generate twenty five hundred just from organic traffic. You no, know, I haven't done any paid marketing. I haven't done any any affiliate. But organic programs. through sorry Zendesk the Zendesk through the uh, Zendesk marketplace. Yeah, marketplace as well. So uh, really, so really, uh, just to, to coming back to that revenue point because this is really common. Um, the two big fears that I see with aspiring entrepreneurs, one, they, you fear of getting started, right? So they, they just talk about things and never do it. Second, though, is asking for money because it's, it's scary to 
basically go like, hey, Tamir, okay, great. If you like it, will you actually give me some of your money, hard-earned money for this thing? And that's quite scary because it, it can and will end in lots of rejection. Do, do you think there was, I mean, you're an experienced entrepreneur, but do, do you think there was fear there? Or was it just like, well, you know, this is just a side thing. I don't really think about it much. Like, what, what changed in terms of your mindset saying, actually, I want to make some money from this? So really, I started seeing the bills. Uh, people were installing that, and uh, I had more usage on Make.com, but I wasn't seeing any money. But in reality, it wasn't good enough. Until ChatGPT came out and the APIs were available, it wasn't good enough. There was, like I knew that if I tell people I'm going to charge money for that, then I'm going to lose them all because like nobody would would pay for that. And if you want to kind of like double down on that, then the only one that were paying was Grammarly. And they're still paying, but initially they started paying even for the regex, uh, for the basic version, uh, because they wanted uh, an NDA. And I only do NDAs in like an enterprise uh, package because that's liability for, for the company. So I have to charge something for that. And eventually, like really just before the chat GPT APIs came out, they reached back and said, you know what, we tried it for a few months. It's not driving significant value, so we're going to stop the subscription. So in a sense, I did the experiment of giving a very solid and customer, you know, a very good customer, you could say, is a design partner, a paid plan, and it only stuck there for like a few months and they decided to cancel. So... I did. I, I'm feeling fairly confident in saying the product wasn't delivering very meaningful, like a lot of meaningful mm -hmm. value before the ChatGPT API came. Up. Yeah, and that, I mean that's, that's. I love the way you talk, phrase that. Confident, knowing it's not delivering enough value. Like you're not saying that in a way like, "Oh my God, the world's ending." It's just like, okay, there's a clear data point or a couple of data points. Therefore, I need to change this thing, and then by changing that thing, you, you lead to revenue. Whereas it would also be very easy to go, oh my God, this is just, it's just a bad idea. Nobody wants it. And therefore I'm going to stop completely with it. Uh, would have been, a, I think, an easy path to take there um, as, as well. Um, in terms I of where I did... one thing about it. I will say one thing about this. I did, the reason I didn't shut it down, because if I had like five people, you know, using it for two years, I would have just shut it down and, and that's it. But for two years, I saw people, you know, signing up and leaving, signing up and leaving, signing up and leaving. So I, I did see there is some interest. There was some movement. It wasn't like stale for like two years and then suddenly it, it blew up. It, it, there was some movement. And then I just, I was able to capitalize on that movement only after two years. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I want to come back to a point you made. It's a nice to have. For some, you know, uh, the the famous analogy of a, is it a vitamin or a painkiller? Um, in my experience, it's easier selling something when the pain is very acute because people are just crying out for a solution. They're searching. They're willing to just take the chance more in testing out this random new product they've come across. Why do you think it works that this is, it's only a nice to have, but it, but as you said, brings in nearly 3K per month. Why is that? Why do, you, why do you think it works building a product that solves a non-acute problem still? So first you could, and you know, that's an argument I'm having with myself and also with people I speak with about this. So technically, would you say a product that has 150 comments of people asking for that from since 2014 is nice to have or is it a must have like a lot of people would say oh i have like validation for the next you know one billion dollar startup uh, from 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 that but i think it's an i think it's a nice to have because eventually it shaves like 15 seconds or 20 seconds of the uh, of the ticket, you know, handling time. It's not like it's solid. It's, it's not like you can let all the agents go because you've installed that plugin. Um, 
so in that sense it's not driving like a performance or an ROI that you could say oh that's like a game changer for support departments uh, but I will make the case or make the argument of within a pool of a hundred thousand Zendesk customers you could probably find 30 40 50 that care enough about something to pay you an, an amount that is not substantial for them but creates something relatively substantial uh, for you so if if you think about this then 50 dollars or a month this is something like people could potentially pay if an agent if if their zendesk team leader is asking them for it if they want to maybe you know a lot of the times it, people tell us that it just makes the agents happier in the work that they don't have to work on uh, stupid uh, tickets uh, some people told us about cases where the agents were compensated on tickets solved and then they needed to make sure people don't pick the thank you messages and resolve them and get and get paid on solving the already solved tickets so there are a few use cases you know down that alley um i think to, to, so to, to jump in there I, I will say to me it seems a case of uh, one it's very it's a very tangible outcome so hey you're going to save 15 to 20 seconds per ticket do the ment you know basically do the mental maths how many tickets are you doing per hour great well this is maybe so saving you half an hour a day if you're an employee you go well great i can use that half an hour to do something else or just chill and watch youtube <laughs> if you're the you know the head of hr or sorry head of customer support you're going to go, great that half hour per employee equals you know ten thousand dollars that we save per month i think the second thing i i tend to see when it's a nice to have is um if the solution is very simple and clear for a non-acute problem people are willing to try it as long as it's easy right? you know i always give the example of G google search it's not a big deal right if i'm tell me we're having a beer tonight watching like england play football because it's the euros at the moment and we go oh my what was the startup of the team that played in 2004 like, it's not an urgent problem but i can just literally click safari google default browser and search and it's probably going to predict what i'm trying to search anyway then it's so easy and simple i'm still going to go and use it right so in that use case not a key problem but simple solution so it work it, it works quite well I think in this case, it sounds yeah. like it's because it's a very specific use, very clear, like here's exactly what the value is going to be, get started. Why wouldn't you, right? It's not going to take half a day to set up, uh, for yeah. example, and particularly with the Zendesk, I agree. Right, you just click to install on the marketplace. Exactly. And I agree, I agree on this. I will say something about the, the first thing that you said, like why wouldn't the head of uh, customer support want this? So I think a lot of entrepreneurs or startup founders come into a CX with the mindset of, oh, I'm going to solve 10 times more tickets. I'm going to save you so much money. I'm going to uh, cut your agent, uh, your age, the number of agents you have by 50%. And reality check, directors of CX or CX leaders don't care about those things. Like they care. They're, they care about agent um, keeping the agents in the team. The agents are living by themselves. They need mm. something to keep them engaged and keep them wanting to stay. They do not own the budget of the company. They do not own the, uh, you know, the. Uh, they do not care if you save the company 30, 30 minutes per uh, employee every day. They are not looking to automate all the work uh, for the company. Like this is not falling under their day-to-day uh, -day responsibilities or the things they think about. They think about how to keep agents motivated, how to improve the customer experience, how to make sure that customers are satisfied, how to make sure that they're responding as fast as they can uh, to customers, how to make sure the CEO doesn't get an email from a, like an angry uh, customer that he, that 
happens to know him and then they get that ricochet from the CEO. That's the thing, like those customer uh, support or customer experience people uh, think about. And, and I think it's because of that, that a lot of the uh, um, straightforward or solutions that go directly into the automation, I'll save you time, I'll save you money, uh, in CX fail. I think there is a startup that does that uh, on the flip side very well called Flip actually. And their tagline is we make your customer experience feel like Alexa. So mm. we, give, or we give your buyers an Alexa-like experience which immediately resonates to that audience. No automation, no time saving, no money saving, just experience, experience, experience. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. This is what I, I sort of call it the iceberg problem there. Um, and this is a really good place to jump off in sort of tips and tactics for building SaaS. But I think one of them would be understanding that I, you know, surface under surface problems. So if you think of an iceberg, right, we, we usually think of, we look at the surface problem. Right? A watch is always a good example. Why do people buy a watch? Oh, it's to tell the time. And then you go, what well, is it? No, really, it's about status, legacy, right? Like passing it on to your children, maybe. And that's a very different under the surface problem to the one you, it's, what you think you're solving is usually not the thing you're actually solving. It's not about, we're yeah. going to save you loads of time. It's no, no, I'm worried about my customer support team leaving. That's the real problem. And making sure that you address the real problem is going to be sort of the, the first step, I always think, to, to building a successful product. But um, I want to make this really actionable. I want to start just with general tips and tactics for, for building a SaaS based on your experience. And then also, I said at the beginning, this comes at a really good time. I, I'm thinking of jumping into, well, committing to a SaaS journey. So trying to look at building 12 SaaS products within 12 months. What general advice would you give an entrepreneur, I think particularly a solopreneur, right? somebody starting out themselves, maybe non-technical, to building a successful SaaS um, business? SaaS, let's say revenue generating SaaS product. So... If you're coming from from your from if you have an idea in your field and you know how to execute on that idea, then I would say package what you've already done. Find find something that you're familiar. Or let's let's do, let's say it differently. I would say if you have an idea, package what you already have, get it online as soon as you can, and just see if it works. For example, I'm uploading more or less one new app to the Zendesk marketplace every every week. Uh, most of them don't do very well, but I did upload like a Shopify AI agent, immediately got like two calls booked with uh, people that were moderately interested. Doesn't matter if they purchase or not right now, just that there is some interest. Um, so that's one thing. If you don't have a very good idea right now, and you want to start with a micro SaaS or do something relatively uh, small, I would say just go around the feature request forum. There is a bunch of, uh, there are a bunch of ideas over there. People are asking for stuff. Monday has one, uh, Zendesk has one, ClickUp, uh, Salesforce, uh, whichever platform you, uh, if you want to build on top of a marketplace, whichever platform you choose, they have a feature request forum. Go to the forum find the most popular yet most uh, not in the roadmap uh, ideas and see if you can build something around it. Yeah, I think it's really good, uh, really good advice there. So sorry, that first point is sort of going, uh, it also could apply to, let's say, in your case, I'm a freelance. I freelance by helping people sell at Zendesk. Okay, great. Well, can I turn that into some sort of software? Uh, or productized packaging? Exactly. Or Exactly. And and maybe even looking at what you're it's something that you have done as a custom solution to those Zendesk uh, setup customers and say or clients and say, okay, how do I package that so that everybody that's using Zendesk can install it and use it on from the marketplace? It's really interesting because it's your your approach, I think this is particularly for micro SaaS, is problems are pretty well known they're quite concrete it's i'm struggling to i waste time sending thank you notes to customers as a customer support agent 
help me solve that. I think that's very different to, I think particularly B two C, where generally it's these sort of more like well can be more nebulous problems like I'm feeling lonely. How could I create better social connection? For example, we could go in a million different directions, and and there are right there's. You know, there's dating apps to meetups to how do I find people to play football with on Thursday night? All these different, like maybe learning a language or connecting with people that way. Many different ways that we can do that. Um, and, and which is why, you know, my training, I'm always saying discovery, 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 speak to people, ideate, realize there are maybe 20 different solutions that you could come up with to solve this one problem. I think Microsoft seems a bit different. W- would you agree with that or not? Uh, yes, and um, that's one of the reasons I'm not doing B2C at all. I had my experience in B2C, but it was really more like, a, you know, I, it was B2C at like $5,000 or $10,000 a year recurring revenue product. So not really like the standard uh, B2C experience. I was selling uh, expat health insurance to people like living abroad. So similar to Safety Wing, maybe, uh, maybe you're familiar with them. Um, so so that's more more of a b2b experience than really well, just to be crystal clear for people listening as well because i think this is not because of the 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 cult the let's say the zeitgeist right the sort of like culture in tech and the whole startup world only until really last year was it suddenly cool again to be profitable or like focus on revenue generation because <laughs> it was yeah. You know, I, I I think we talked about at the beginning. Yeah, I did the whole like, let's go for VC and raise a million straight away and we're going to become like the next Facebook. And revenue's like, we don't need to worry about revenue, we'll work it out. And obviously that didn't happen. And I you know, closed that business within two years. But um, it, it's particularly important when you are not funded because as you found out with Thank You GPT, you are taking on costs. Whatever you're yeah. doing, whether it's, you know, your landing page, your mailing list goes from 50 people to a thousand, all of that comes with cost. And therefore you need to, you need to um, be able to basically, well, you need to be bringing in money to counter the cost, right? Cost yeah. minus uh, um, revenue equals profit. And um, yeah, I think just to remind everyone, you know, that that's why I suppose it makes a lot of sense with Microsoft to sorry to go after specific b2b problems because you know that there's going to be um that, that there's sort of less unknowns in terms of what you should build and there is a culture of paying for SaaS products for businesses right that is a normal thing unlike let's say you, you could launch a way better version of instagram and have a million users but shit if you can't you know, how are you going to make money? Is it going to work? Are ads are going to work? Do you have enough people? You've got all those questions rather than tell me, buy my, you know, Zendesk plugin, $10 a month, $50, $50 a month, more, more sort of concrete, exactly. I suppose. I think one, one other tip for early stage founders, solo founders, there, there are a lot of startup offers that are available for you on infrastructure and uh, tools. So, uh, you can get $150,000 uh, of Microsoft Azure credits, which can go towards OpenAI API usage. So basically, you are getting $150,000 of OpenAI API calls for free just by having a Pulse and a LinkedIn profile. You can get uh, $10,000 from AWS. You can get money from Google Cloud. You get a free year of segment. You get like all those uh email marketing uh platforms give startup like a year for free so there there are a bunch of things you can do to keep your costs very very uh minimal you don't have to pay a lot and what you pay normally grows with with the revenue you have so the more you if if you end up paying you mm-hmm. probably have reached a certain threshold where uh it's like a good where, problem where it have. makes sense to 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 start yeah. paying. There's also so one thing that I think is very two two things I want to talk about. Um, first is tech stack. Second is the men the psychological side of I think starting a SaaS business. But you are I mean you're a CTO by trade, but you use no code. Why why do you do so? And why do you think that's particularly important as a solopreneur? 
Yeah, so I will say I'm I'm not a programmer. So I did like 50% of computer science in university, dropped out in the middle, uh, started my business. So um, I'm just for the sake of fitting into boxes, I sometimes write CTO, but really I'm mm-hmm. kind of like all rounder than 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 a s- specifically focused on the technical side. And the reason I use no code is because I feel it's it allows it, I am willing right now to pay in flexibility, which is what software gives you for the sake of getting to market faster, testing more ideas, seeing what works and what doesn't. I also, I was initially drawn to this lifestyle kind of business. So I wasn't looking to raise VCs and, uh, you know, build a large software development uh, team. So so this is how I got into, into no code. And I feel that now the the capabilities are even better than they were a few years ago. So you could build a product that I feel you can confidently get to a hundred thousand dollars in annual revenue. Uh, so basically, at least up to ten thousand uh, dollars per month with no code tools. Um, I feel there there is you know an element of visual programming in there so you need to know what you're doing Babel, for example Babel call themselves the visual programming uh, platform they don't call themselves the uh, yeah, leaks for uh, applications so then it's really yeah i I've, i'm i'm non-technical but I, I could probably be hired as like a junior front end um and i found that but I, mean, I like working with Bubble, but having a, some technical understanding definitely helps. Um, exactly. Um, although not necessary, but but yeah, I think there is there is like it's some. I mean, obviously, yeah, it helps. It helps, right? Cause you just understanding simple things like how does a database connect to a front end and store stuff and APIs and and the, sort exactly. of the, the building blocks. And the links between databases and, uh, you know, what's a one-to-one relationship, what's a one-to-many relationship. So those things help. And I think realistically, it's probably more of a low-code uh, process. And, not, you know, you're really, you're building in low-code and you're not building in, in complete no-code. It's not Zapier. It's not like yeah, drag, drag and drop, drop and like yeah. and have a workflow and that's it. But if you have some technical capability and or you're willing to invest a few months or a few weeks uh, to learn the, the technical concepts, then I think that would serve you for, for the lifetime. And it will also unlock a world of opportunities uh, for for product creation, I f- I personally feel that the value of make Babel and so on and so on is not so much in not writing code. It's more in not worrying about everything else. Like you just Completely do what you wanted, that. and they do it, f- and they do the rest for you. And this, you I think this, as you said, it's the speed the speed to test ideas. I think is the one that that uh, I mean, we looked. I looked at two two good friends, but also sort of data scientists and CTO uh, building something with AI this year and we just did, didn't have enough time but also we we just I realized we were just faffing around with setting up good infrastructure it was just like well what's the point if we're not getting something to market and validating an idea within yeah. days uh, just a funny thing on that because I'm, I'm as I said starting this journey like I've got some experience with bubble some technical experience um where would you where would you suggest like I start my 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 learning experience? So what I, I'm going to, as I said, commit to sort of building twelve products in twelve months. Where should I start with that? Is it just jump in and work it out as you go? How would you suggest I start that journey? Yeah, so I will say that twelve products in twelve months. I did a similar experiment this year for ten products in in twelve months. I think realistically, uh, you have to define what is a product. Like if you push an extension to the Zendesk marketplace and you're not promoting it, not investing anything in getting reviews, not investing anything in paid marketing, is this a product or not? So that's that's one question I, I have on, on that concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second thing is uh, you have to... 
obviously you are not looking to do 12 products. You're looking to do, if, if product number three succeeds, then you're going to stick with product number three. You're mm-hmm. not going to go to up all the way up to 12. So there is some, uh, I feel, uh, some aura of, you know, the competition for the, the race for the sake of the race. But um, let, I think... let, let me reframe that because that, that, it's quite specific. What I'm looking to do is build um, no code plus AIML products. So learn how to build them quickly and then get them. They get to market. I'm fine with. I've done done that for years. How would you suggest I go about learning most effectively? So what I would recommend if I were you and I would come with little technical background is I would start with basic computer science uh, courses, algorithms, like intro to algorithms, intro to databases, intro to uh, I don't know if statistics, but maybe something around, you know, how uh, understanding how those AI models work and something very, very basic, just statistics, algorithms, so you can really plan the backend, databases, so you can plan the, uh, the, the, st- the, the data and the relationships uh, between the different uh, types of, of data that you're going to have. And and really from there, I'll just get like a course on Babel. Dot co- on on Babel, uh, you can get them on Udemy. There is like the startup founder course for Babel, and and that would walk you through pretty much everything you need to build like a working uh, prototype in Babel. Since you know algorithms, you could probably either build the workflows, the backend workflows on Babel, or you could use Make uh, to to build your backend. Uh, I would also recommend learning about APIs and maybe even you know if if you want to go a bit deeper, um, how code works, software like object oriented programming, uh, how to create like. Uh, classes of objects and you know deriving something from you know a, a certain let's say different like object into sub object so imagine like what kind of like understanding the relationship with, between an animal and a tiger an elephant and a fly because they all have like certain mm-hmm. properties that are uh, shared between all the animals uh, so stuff like that and then so yeah some basic object-oriented programming basic algorithms basic statistics basic databases and then you should be good to go to work on Babel and like I said visually program uh, your app nice I think I think it's yeah, really good advice I'm most tempted to skip and just go into building but just having a good theoretical understanding, yeah, you know, high level, and then going in is probably going to save me time. From what yeah. I remember doing, I did like React course and some back end courses back in the day, but definitely need to restart with that. Um, tell me, I think it's a really good place to to wrap up. Um, you could definitely do a round two, talk about you know you stood focusing on clear sight. I'm interested to hear the thought process, how that goes. But maybe it makes sense to do round two when that is um, live, see how that journey is going. Um, let's finish with some quick fire questions. Um, sure. First question, what one piece of advice would you give an aspiring entrepreneur wanting to get started? Any type of business. So I will say don't fall in love with your ideas. So if you have an idea, that's fine. Ideas come and go. Uh, what you really need to optimize for is staying in the game. So the first rule of business is uh, staying in business. And and I would say don't take bets that can knock you out too early in the process. Like make sure you stay in the game. Make sure you don't invest like two hundred thousand dollars of your personal saving into a SaaS product. And I think the if you decide to go to do SaaS, the way to do it in 2024 is to go lean and to build it uh, on no-code, low-code tools. 
Uh, if you do something else, just make sure you stay in the game. Yeah, it's really good advice, actually, uh, from a psychological perspective, just staying in the game by not, you know, not not bankrupting yourself, obviously, but also not to sort of take all of the confidence away. And uh, yeah, I love it. Second question: What one piece of advice would you give somebody struggling to get their first sale? Let's say, sort of, I think particularly scared of asking, let's say, for that first consultancy deal or asking for that first paid customer with the GBT. Yeah, so I would say you really like I I, I want to say that you just have to ask, but it's it's obviously counter like it's not very helpful. Um, I will I I kind of like give me a moment to phrase it properly. Well, just ask is good advice, but maybe you could expand. Like, what does that actually mean? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to um, to expand on this a bit a bit more. Really it's like asking someone on a date. So you you see you see something you you see someone you like, you have to approach and you know, make the move. You have to ask someone for the date. You do, otherwise the 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 story doesn't move forward. So as long as you're just standing in the corner and thinking about this and you know thinking should i approach should i not approach should i do it should i not do it and and once you do it you're obviously happy afterwards that you've done it so you have like three seconds or five seconds and i think there is like some something about this a three second rule that if you think about this for more than three seconds then you're automatically kicking into the why i'm not going to do it so i think the next time you have the opportunity just ask and do it kind of like even though it's uncomfortable even though it's hard and as you practice asking people out asking people for money and asking people out and asking people to get their credit card out that's almost the same and so as you practice you're obviously going to get a lot of no's but you will get your first yes after five ten uh, times you ask probably sooner than than later yeah that's good advice awesome any calls to action links places to follow you before we wrap up yeah so i'm tamir bashkin you can find me on uh, on linkedin uh, if you are first if if in any way you have a microsas that you've built and you're looking to sell feel free to reach out i'm interested in speaking with you and if you're a junior entrepreneur and you're looking for a position feel free to reach out i'm happy to speak with you and yeah i think that's that's pretty much it for today thank you very much for having me awesome thanks so much to me and uh as I said, uh, valuable for the audience, but also very valuable for me today. Uh, very good timing with this. So great to, to speak to you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to another episode of Free Founders. If you enjoyed this episode and want to get each shiny new episode straight to whatever platform you use to listen to your podcast, please subscribe using the subscribe button below. If you're feeling generous, why not share with a friend? 